welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the HR Revolution or Evolution. No matter what way you look about and look at it, it's the revolution of HR for the evolution of business. And we do that through having conversations with thought leaders, whether they're practitioners themselves and working in high ranking positions within HR or outside experts like Adam Gibson today, uh, who wrote an incredible book called Agile Workforce Planning. Um, and we have conversations with psychometric analysis like Igor. <laughs> Uh, we're really trying to hone in and dive into the humanistic needs, behaviors, and understanding of business today. So HR professionals, practitioners, and people that are thinking about potentially entering the realm of HR have the skills and tools necessary to be successful in the role, not only today, but in the future as the business needs it. So with my co-host today, Chris, <laughs> how are you doing, brother? I'm doing great, Kevin. Thank you so much. Adam, it's great to have you here. Uh, real quickly, everybody, our guest today is Adam Gibson. As Kevin said, he is the founder and director of Agile Workforce Planning, and he's also currently a director at EY. Adam is also the author, as Kevin said, of the book Agile Workforce Planning, which you can see behind Adam there uh, on his bookshelf. Fantastic. I got, I got it right in front of me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I also have it, so we're, we're all prepared. That's fantastic. The book provides a roadmap for identifying and implementing processes to align people with strategy in order to improve performance. Throughout his career, Adam has held leadership positions in both workforce planning and people operations leadership at Capita, PwC UK, as well as with the British Army and the Metropolitan Police in London. On behalf of Kevin and myself, Adam, it is awesome to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure, gents. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you couldn't tell by Adam's accent, he's not from the United States. Uh, he's actually all over the pond in the UK. And so I wanted to start out. I knew you grew up in Manchester. Are you a Man United fan or a Manchester City fan? Manchester City. Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, no, man. I'm only kidding. I was a Manchester United fan. I was there when they played Roma for that uh, Champions League game. And I really realized how, how seriously you took football that I saw a couple of Italians with yeah. some bloody heads entering the stadium. It was pretty, pretty, pretty surreal, but uh, amazing uh, to be in Manchester. It's quite the city. So uh, we, yeah, we live, we live for it. We live for it. But yeah, we very much demarcated. You're either red or you blue. <laughs> yeah, great. Hey Adam, quick question for our, for our audience, just so they can get to know you a little bit better. If you, we looked at your current, you know, Spotify list or your current, what are you listening to? What do you've got, you know, teed up when you, when you're either working out or going for a jog or driving in the car somewhere? Oh, so my, my music tastes, and I don't know whether this happens to everyone, my music tastes sort of kind of ground to a halt probably in the sort of, in, you know, in the, in the nineties, or you know, the, the early two okay. thousands. Um, so I'll, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm exercising, I am probably going to be putting on either part of the Rocky soundtrack or, you know, right. something from Top Gun. <laughs> like, literally, the Eye of the Tiger. Just stuck in the there dark. There you game. go. There you go. That'll get you, that'll I, get I, you I, the, the last tiger. half of that workout. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Thank you. That's hilarious. Well, I wanted, I wanted to jump right in while we, uh, I know uh, time is of the essence and we only have you for, for a short here, time here, Adam. So I kind of wanted to jump right in and first, thank you for your military service, um, kind yeah. of in each chapter and each uh, book uh, within the org uh, book itself, excuse me. Um, Chris and I were, were talking this morning and I was like, isn't it great that he has all these examples, but his examples are the most extreme examples within that scenario, right? Um, so one, thank you for your military service and thank you for those real life, painting that real life picture of how stressful of an environment really is and how you have to keep your cool as a leader. So I wanted to start off with leaders just went through one of their biggest stress tests and continue to go through their biggest stress tests. Um, with the great resignation, with, with obviously the, the pandemic, and we're still not through the pandemic yet. Um, what, did, what would you tell leaders, um, given that your military history and your background, as to how they can prepare themselves for the future, right? And what things they should be doing right now, because they're going through their biggest stress test as an organization, as a CEO themselves, or what, what advice would you give them, Adam? I suppose the the biggest bit that you've got to have is, is a belief that you're going to win. 
You've got to have the belief that, you, that you're going to win. And I, I talk to I talk to leaders at all levels, and often the thing I'll, I'll find that prevents them from really being successful is their view of uncertainty about the future. Well, we don't know what will happen here. Well, we don't know what what will happen here. And I remember it particularly acutely through the pandemic of having of having one of those conversations. Um, and I said, if you look at what you've gone through for the last nine months of pandemic, what your teams have gone through, the uncertainty, the heartache, the hours, the effort, have you really gone through all of that in the genuinely genuine belief that your business is only going to last for another three months? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Of course you've got um, a mindset that goes longer. You've got a belief that you're going to go longer than that apply that to your business decisions because you've absorbed that internally you reckon you wouldn't bother you wouldn't but go through the effort of everything that people have gone through if people didn't have a belief and a hope yeah. and a faith that they would be successful in the end but you see people not do not apply that mm -hmm. to their own business decisions so what i urge people is take that belief that's inside you that gets you going every day and apply that to your business decisions because that is what will really accelerate in rather than talking yourself out of it. That's yeah. my big piece of advice. And I think, I think too, is like kind of touching on that is like the, the word that I hated during 2020, 2021, and still in 2022 is the word resiliency, right? It's that, that goal that I can now interview and I can ask that same question of the person is, give me a time you dealt with a stressful situation and, and how did you, how did you deal with that? Right. Is how other ways are we going to learn if who is resilient and who is not right. That was how I was kind of questioning the business practices. And you talk about the effects based approach. And I think you're kind of touching on this right now is that we're so obsessed with the goal that we have no idea on what it actually takes to get there because we're focused more on the outputs than the, than what it takes from an inputs perspective in order to get those desired outputs. Can you kind of go into that just a little bit for me? Yeah, so you'll often see that people like that, um, for a number of degrees, people either go almost too far or, or not far enough. Um, the big part around taking the effects-based approach was more, the starting point is around how you utilize the expertise around you. I've lost count of the amount of conversations I've had with very senior people as they've tried to get into the nth degree of how you solve something. And it's like, well, why did you hire everyone else? What's yeah. the, why is everyone else involved in this? If you're gonna go, well, what we need is David yeah. here to be behaving. Get out of that. <laughs> get your yeah. screwdriver out of that. Talk about what it is that you need at a broader effect bit. We need, we need speed. It, you know, we, this needs to be faster. We need greater speed here. Mm. And it's talking about it at the broader level. What's the effect that needs to be created through a change or, or a way of doing things? And then utilize those who've got the expertise to get into the detail of doing it rather than trying to rather than trying to unpick that bit yourself. And mm. get it, you know, the, the reason that they're senior is typically because they've got that kind of insight, or but perhaps they've done it before. Sure. But it means that you're not utilizing people who've got the best effects. And that was the lesson that I learned. I, I sort of I tell the story of in, in, in the book of doing that on of, of understanding that as an approach on operations of saying, I could tell, you know, if I wanted to, I could get right into the detail of, oh, we need this, we need that. But actually, I'm not the expert. Um, I might have been the expert five years ago, 10 years ago, but I've got an expert with me who does understand that mm -hmm. and utilize the technology I've not even heard of the effect that we wanted. So that's yeah. that taking that effects-based approach is utilize, utilize the expertise around you, utilize the people mm -hmm. around you to, you know, you talk about the effect, use the experts to create the specifics. Mm -hmm. And that's just trust, a great, trust those closest to the problem. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah. And that's yeah. just a great approach. I think any leadership or any leader should take as they go through it. So that's great. Adam, let's talk about the book. Um, and really the book is focused around the seven rights uh, as you list them out. And for those who may not have read the book yet, because I know that you guys will all go up and grab a copy. Uh, the seven rights are around capability, size, location, time, cost, risk, and shape. Uh, and you spend, you know, saying capabilities at the core, right? So we really got to focus on 
the, the, the core capabilities of that organization when you're looking at workforce planning. One thing I heard you say in a previous interview is um, when it comes to capability, knowledge, you know, was a part of that, but knowledge is becoming less and less important because information is more widely available than it has ever been. Um, and that intrigued me hearing you talk about that. And I think you used a, an example about Excel. You know, you, we used to have experts in Excel, but now anyone can go and Google, take a half a minute and find, figure out how to do a pivot table. When I yeah, think about I mean, other types of specialized approaches, like, I don't know, aircraft pilots, I'm not going to be able to go and Google how to fly a plane. So where is that line with knowledge that you see as we look to the future? Because, you know, I do agree knowledge is everywhere and information is everywhere, but how do we really kind of put that into place when we're so, looking at the planning? Um, so a lot, so part of this will come down to, um, what's your, what's people's tolerance around risk? Okay. What's the what's the level of risk that they're prepared to accept? So I appreciate there's certain things that people might just go, absolutely never going to happen, not in this profession. But let's let's take the point of um, let's take the point of you know flying a flying an aircraft, something that I do not know how to do. I've got no absolutely <laughs> no background <laughs> having flown an aircraft before. Um, but what what have what have we seen uh, what have we seen over time the um, the level of understanding that people need evolves in very in very different ways yeah. um, and so you've got you've got knowledge which is going to be down to a lot of the systems and how they and, and how they work um, but I would I would probably suggest that the knowledge required that was based on the mechanics of flying a plane rather than the technical the technicality of the instruments yeah. the, the understanding of the mechanics is quite different to what it is now sure um, and a lot of that will be based on the knowledge that people were requiring was you know if you think about wright brothers you know they were applying a very different type yeah. of knowledge and skill to what's going to be applied now people's knowledge is going to be is going to be more around knowledge of the systems knowledge of issue resolution to do with the systems mm -hmm. rather than a lot of the mechanics around flying a plane there's, there's technology, a lift. Yeah. technology there's, there's has dealt with a lot of things technology that's, to help with that sure you know, you've got autopilot that takes that takes care of it so you're so different knowledge important knowledge but it's actually going to be quite it's actually going to be quite specific. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The other thing to remember is, and this is going to, this is a key point when it comes to when it comes to like aircraft, because this is one thing that I do know. What is it that they rely on? They rely on checklists. The checklist yeah. is what wow. is what keeps you safe. When things are going if things are going wrong, you go through the checklist, you go through the drill, and therefore you don't need to have it up here, because the worst thing about have about having to rely on something up here is the other part of capability is mindset. If yeah. something's going wrong and you're under pressure, you don't want to be trying to remember things. You want to be able to go through the checklist and keep yourself safe. That's good. <laughs> I love that because that was just, it, it just makes it all, all the more real because I just watched, I think it was called Downfall of, of uh, we're talking yeah, about Boeing. Yeah, it. Yes. <laughs> so same exact thing. And I love what you, how you guys, how you just brought that all together, Adam, because you're right. We're talking about the, the advancements of technology, right? And AI at this point. But we're still saying that it's not going to disrupt the market like we think it's going to disrupt the market. It's going to have an impact, but it's going to require new skills, right? Yeah. And new training, yes, understood, because there's still going to be a need from a humanistic perspective within sure. that process. But the knowledge, like you just said, shifts and changes with it, right? Yeah. And now I know, now I don't need the same, <clears throat> this is why I laugh about job descriptions right now and requirements. It's like, when's the last time that this thing was revisited that they need a PhD? Yeah. Probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And, and why are we limiting who we're bringing in within our organization by having this laundry list of requirements that used to be the case, but we don't have the time to get back to that. And I think what you were saying earlier was the change and getting comfortable with change. And the way that you describe change, and I really, 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 really loved it within the book itself, is that you kind of talk about how it is comparative to, uh, excuse me, and I'm going to edit that part out, but the stages of grief. Um, and I really loved how you compared the stages of grief to the stages of crisis slash change. 
And here we are coming out of the pandemic, out of a crisis, right? And now here globally, there's a little uncertainty, right? How do, how does business, how do business leaders and how do HR practitioners and professionals, how do we handle that first objective or the first roadblock, which is getting comfortable with change, which I think is what you described, Evan. Okay. I think that it's, it's realizing that it's inevitable. Hmm. Once you realize that something's, once you realize that something is absolutely going to happen, that's the first part, you know, it gets rid of the, you know, the denial part of it. That's where everyone gets yeah. stuck is the, is, you know, is the, is the never going to, never going to happen. And once you accept it, you recognize it, that's the part that enables you to progress. It gets you past the inertia of, is it going to happen? Isn't it going to happen? And therefore, how much do I commit to it? Once you know that something's, once you know that something's a certainty, then that's where, that's where people start getting into action. Um, and therefore, the, I suppose one of the crucial things as part of understanding changes, not only recognizing that it's inevitability, um, but anything that happened, you know, the things that could happen in the future, there is always a range in terms of the personal impact to you. Mm. Um, and so recognizing that, that there is a most likely future for you in any given circumstance, there's a most likely future, there is a best case and there is a worst case. <laughs> So unless you're utterly negative and miserable with your life, you're gonna you're going to try. You know, you, I always recommend you try you plan on the basis of the most likely scenario. You don't want to be too optimistic. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be miserable. Mm -hmm. So plan on the most likely scenario, but make sure you've got sufficient contingencies in place to deal with a worst case scenario. Make sure you're flexible enough to be able to do to take the opportunities of a best case scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why people save money for a rainy day, just mm -hmm. in case things are bad. Um, <clears throat> but it's equally why people will want to be attuned to the opportunities out there so that people are nimble enough to be able to get after it. Mm -hmm. and, and so kind of going deeper into that, Adam, we talk about finance. Finance uh, here in the United States generally accepted the accounting principles have been the code of accountings for accountants for so long in business, right? And what we're actually saying is that, yes, that is like driving the business in the rear view mirror. And it tells you what has already had happened within the organization, not why, not what will. And here what you are saying is that we need to kind of break down that way of thinking and get back into more of a strategic thought process. How are you building and establishing those types of relationships? Because in the book as well, and I see it on a daily occurrence is that HR and finance seem like they're operating on two different teams, but intrinsically yeah. they need to be on the same team, having the same conversations yeah. and discussions because their correlations and relationships are so tangled, but we fight to separate them so much. How, how are you getting finance teams in your current role or in past position to really see that, that inherent, that yes, one impacts the other and the other one impacts the other. And they, there is a relationship there. Yeah, I mean, often, so what I've seen is, you know, one of the big reasons why the pet, why fine HR and finance just don't seem to get along is these are, these are what I call professional roles. So the standards for it don't come from the business. The standards of how they operate come outside. It's either based on your finance qualifications or it's based on, you know, CIPD in the UK, um, SPHR. Yeah. yeah. So the standard comes sure. from outside. Yeah. So if if you know you so therefore you see those parts of the business where it comes from the business itself, it's easier for them to get along than someone has, who, than parts of the business that have been told externally this is how we do things. So I I do hold the professional organisation to account for some of this. Yeah. But equally, and you'll recognize this, part of it is down to power relationships. Mm -hmm. And you will see, depending on how the business is run, is the business run in, you know, in a strategic big play way? Mm -hmm. Is it run purely by finance who are looking, you know, a year, a year, a year, a year? Mm -hmm. You know, is it run by HR where you're taking more of a people centric approach? And you see these dynamics, but in different organizations um, and the, it is the ones where it's typically the ones where it is financially driven year, year, year. Mm -hmm. This is more, which is more of the problematic one. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we get them? How do we get them playing nice together? Mm -hmm. um, 
One is you've got to make friends with the finance people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I you know. I, I don't know if if you will have any finance people who are listeners. So I, I will. Uh, I will tell this. No, some. Yeah, yeah, some. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Ulrich once said in a workshop that I was in, "You need to. If you're in HR, you need to understand the language of finance. Yeah. You need to understand the language that they are speaking, the principles that they are going to talk about." And the, th the things that are key to them that are also key to the business leaders. If you want to learn these things, find a finance pit person, ask them to go to lunch. They don't have friends, so they will take you up on it. <laughs> yes, I would agree with that. My father's one. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and that's the way to do it. You learn the, learn the language and start to recognize, okay, that is, that's going to be impacting on the people bit here. Um, we've got a way that impacts across here and then getting actually not once you've got the language right get them alongside for me was around unpicking how much time do they spend doing things that could be solved through taking a more people-centric approach and there was a lot of that of real of really the sell for them was I can just save you time because you're not having to spend your time redoing this, redoing this, redoing this, which is what they spend a lot of time doing. A lot of time, you know, there's nowhere else in the organization that talks about reconciliation more than finance does. Yeah. And it's because mm -hmm. everything's a mess and they need to spend a lot of time reworking it. So taking a, we've got that, don't worry. And then we will continue to speak. We'll continue to have a conversation to make sure you're happy. That's how we get things. That's how, how we really get things going. That's good. And then those, we'll get, we'll touch a little bit more on those relationships, I think, in a little bit um, with a couple of more questions around it. So that was fantastic. Uh, Adam, I, I want to talk about workforce planning as a concept, as a theory. I, I think the first time I heard it was probably back in 2010 when I was working for an organization. And at that point, it was really a, a once a year type of activity where you looked at, you know, what does the annual forecast look like? You know, we looked at attrition, we looked at expansion and put together just, you know, it was more of a talent acquisition, I think, exercise. Yeah. Talk to me about what's happened over the last, you know, 12 years or so and how this has evolved to be, you know, and you talk about, it's the title of your book, Agile, you know, yeah. an ever evolving process within the organization. Yeah, so this is, I mean, work workforce planning as a broad concept, yeah. you know, it's been happening for decades, you know, longer than that. I'm being silly when I'm saying decades. It's, you know, it's been happening for millennia. You know, the person who's got, you know, the person who's gone, you know, who's up in the morning to put the first brick on the pyramid mm -hmm. you know, was doing was doing workforce <laughs> planning. Yeah, exactly. Um, so whether you're doing so you've got people who are doing it short term, which is who's doing this today? That person's off sick, who's covering it? Mm -hmm. It's always been going on. Then you've got the sort of the annual planning, which for effectively for as long as businesses have been around, for as long as finance have been around, you've got them going on this annual cycle. Um, and simply driven by the, you know, driven by the, you know, the, the reports around pro, uh, around reporting and around taxation. Um, so that has largely driven the cycle. It's people trying to do, you know, effectively budgeting and budgeting on an annual yeah. basis. Yeah. So you've got workforce planning that's been happening for, you know, a long time, but coming out of the finance function. And then strategic workforce planning, again, you know, big ticket has been going on, you know, since about the Second World War. Um, but you're right. It was still only on. It was still only one-off activities that people were doing. So maybe people would be looking five years out, ten years out, but they only did that once in a blue moon. Um, and and so you had that. You had that happening. And then you know a couple of things evolved out of that, which was one, which is one that it happened out of consultancies and professional services, where what people would do is come help create a single plan. And then they would go. Yeah. And so the challenge of whether it was someone external coming in or whether it was organizations doing it once is you created a plan. And that's as far as everyone went. The role of workforce planning was to create a plan. Yeah. Yeah. But then what happens when things change? And you see, as you go, if you as you look back over time at when workforce planning was popular and when everyone thought it didn't work. It all happens around the times of great uncertainty. 
Sure. Yes, we can do workforce planning. Everything gets disrupted. Workforce planning is dreadful. Um, <laughs> and it's just rinse and repeat of that yeah. over yeah. many, many decades. Um, and so my the approach that I've taken is recognising that, that, that we missed the point, however long ago this happened, that the point of workforce planning wasn't to create the plan. The point mm. of workforce planning was to create the workforce. Mm. And once you recognise what it is that you're supposed to be creating, then you also recognise... Therefore, the plan can't be static. So many organizations got fixated by this glossy strategic workforce plan that they could put on a website or share, yeah. send us to shareholders. Strategic workforce plans aren't like that. Strategic workforce plans are gritty operational documents of how we create the workforce we need. Okay. With the flexibility that I talked about of you know, recognizing what needs to happen in a worst case, best case scenario. Um, and reviewed on a regular enough basis so that you can keep it live, mm -hmm. taking into account all the things that happen, either internally because the organisation chooses to go in a different direction, mm -hmm. or externally because you get a pandemic hitting you. Mm -hmm. And I think what you touched on is like setting the intentions. I think it is what is what your kind of our intention drives our attention, and that's exactly what you're kind of focusing in on there. And I really love like uh, the the changing of the mindset as to what is the purpose, right? And I think when we realign that and set that intention, that we start to take a more intentional approach to workforce planning, right? Absolutely. And right now, and I see businesses that are so desperate for talent, it's just saying, bring me anybody. And, yeah. and you kind of talk about that throughout the book as to, well, furloughs are kind of, it's a very challenging time. It is how we help have to communicate that effectively across the workforce. And there are going to be needs to realign workforce and get rid of people within institutions as we kind of change and chart out and strategically workforce plan. And we're kind of tapping into, I think you said the seven drivers. Um, I think you had seven Bs. By, by, uh, I, I typically say you are buying, renting, growing, or botting talent. You kind of kind of talked a little bit more and added a few more pieces yep. of flavor there. But that is going to be the makeup of the workforce. And this is kind of fighting everything that businesses know to be true today. How are, we, how are you preparing these organizations are getting them to understand and see that this is certainly going to happen. And we're talking about this yeah. very quickly. We're talking about gig economy becoming 60 plus percent of the work jobs in the next five years. We think that the pandemic probably put some gasoline and made that happen a little bit quicker, right? Yeah. We're evolving much faster than we anticipated because of the pandemic. And most businesses I fear, and you're probably seeing as well, are behind the eight ball. So what are the steps that you're recommending that they can start taking today to really get those initial, that initial foundation built for tomorrow? Takes you back to right at the, right, the conversation we were having right at the start is, <clears throat> are you, you know, are you assuming you're going to win? Do you mm -hmm. have genuine, genuine belief? If you are, what are the steps that you would take in regard to the workforce? So the, 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 the real struggle for talent right about now is, you know, you're seeing certain roles um, where the where wage growth is rocketing. You know, the price of the price of scarce talent in the marketplace is absolutely rocketing. Well, why is that? Be, why, or, you know, why would we think that that's happening? Well, it's because organisations have been sat on their hands, going, "I don't know what's going to happen, so let's just sit tight, ride it out, ride out the storm, and then we'll start think, we'll start acting." Yeah. At the point at which we've got greater certainty <clears throat> and you see you see you know the the certainty being the way that different organizations and different industries have actually gone right we need to get out to market and hiring we need to look at the hiring data over time <clears throat> of, of of how it's been happening you know when when you see these are the hiring spikes it wasn't a hiring spike because suddenly the organization was in desperate need of yeah. Python <laughs> skills at that point in time. It didn't. It reflected confidence in the marketplace. So if you're a pessimist, then you'll wait for the signal. You'll wait for the signal of signal of confidence. If you are more optimistic and believing that you are going to win in the long term, then you will continue to play the game constantly rather than sit sitting out a few hands so that's why it's all difficult for so many organizations they sat out a number of hands at poker at the table and now they're desperately trying to get themselves into a position of strength while everyone else has got the chips 
Yeah, and you have no chips or, 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 and no leverage at that point. Now you're yeah. playing catch up. And that's and that's really what I started to see. And rather, I got disheartened, I guess, is the disconnect between finance and senior leadership and HR or the people, people, whoever, whatever, whatever title we want to put on it, people ops, whatever, um, whoever's responsible for the people. There was just a huge disconnect because it just showed that everybody went to the, the monetary value, right, to, to retain, to attract, to develop. Um, and to engage was all monetary driven retention bonuses, sign on bonuses. It just yeah. really showed us how disconnected that we are. And Chris and myself and after reading your book, I know you're very data driven. And you talked about Dave Ulrich speaking, speaking at one of these engagements. And, and I say that frequently is that organizations, HR needs to understand the world of finance. You need to understand how the business makes money, how they lose money and where do they spend it. And if you yeah. can't articulate that, then you have no idea on where you're going to be able to add value to that that organization. What is the future of data, right? How do we use data? How do we get more comfortable? Because that's the international language of, of business, which is numbers. Where, where are you seeing as the future of, of people analytics and how organizations and better organizations are starting to use their people insights and data to drive actionable insight and, and action? It's, it's, you're bang on. It's precisely to the point of it's about connecting these people-related things to what it is that the business is trying to achieve. Simon Sinek says, start with why. Mm -hmm. And the why is the organ is what the organization is trying to achieve, not what the business is trying to achieve. Yeah. The amount of HR functions that have not only struggle to try and get genuinely get a seat at the table, but frustrate their own people and damage a particular concepts because they're foolish with them. You know, a huge one for me is employee engagement. Yeah, it stayed the so, same. <laughs> and what's happened is you've you've got HR functions who said we've you know we've got a problem because we've got low in, we've got low engagement, and therefore we need to do X, Y, and Z in order to improve engagement. And the business will go, okay, but what does that give me? Yeah. And the HR will go, but engagement. <laughs> you know, we're not, you're not getting this. You can't just quote the same metric back at me. When you go, because engagement is particularly driving our ability to do X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if this is happening, our, ab our ability to achieve your business goals of this amount of revenue, this amount of profit, this amount of cost reduction, whatever it is, mm -hmm. your ability to do that is therefore impeded. That is why you need to invest in X. Now it makes sense, yep. but that's the bit where everything where everything goes wrong of as this being able to connect one thing that's being measured to another thing that's being measured. And mm -hmm. that's what the analytics approach is all about, making mm -hmm. that, making that connection, being able to triangulate, triangulate one thing to another and go. This is where it happens. And Dave Green so talks about it in his book is like, that's the translator. And that's why it's like, those people are hard to find because it is a rare talent. It is, it is hard to understand how business impacts those desired business outcomes or the people desired, desired outcomes of the business. It's, it's really, really interesting to hear you kind of talk about that. Adam. Thank you. Cause this is, this is just so fascinating as the, the common themes within the book itself one of the things I wanted to ask you too is um, you talked to, again, not to go back and harp on the stages of grief and crisis, but I think it's um, help, it would help organizations kind of set that intentional culture environment that they're trying to create right now. Can you kind of go into those, uh, the, 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 the crisis and really how organizations can leverage that? And similarly to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the biggest thing at all, and I want to get into is the end of that is your Drucker quote, which was amazing. It's kind of talking about time, because I think well, everything that we talked about today and everything that we continue to talk about on our show and in your book is that time is of the most important essence, but we have a really crappy job of protecting our own time and valuing it. So I, I know it's a long question, but I wanted to kind of highlight those areas within the book that I just found that popped out at me and I've really took a lot of value out of. Yeah, the, the 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 biggest part is um, you have to focus on your people. Um, if you you know, depending on the type of organization you're organization you're in, you know your workforce is 
you know, if you're looking at this purely on a miserable cost basis, then they're six, you know, anywhere between 16, 95% of your operational yeah. expenditure. Yeah. Um, so you have to focus, you have to focus your energies on that bit, which is, um, you know, when you, when you are going through change, you, you know, you see, uh, you see organizations all the time go, well, we've got change going on. These are the things that we need to do process wise. They do it when they're thinking about all this, you know, they're thinking about their supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't see them doing it of the, of the really, how do we get everyone mm -hmm. on board this? And crucially is recognizing where you are and recognizing what you want to be. And that's both at the, when you're going at it just purely on a change angle, but more broadly, what organizations are thinking about culture. Again, an, another thing that some HR practitioners have helped damage through not being able to articulate it properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Culture's already there. Mm -hmm. It is manifested in the behaviours of people, but culture is, culture is already there. Mm -hmm. um, what makes it difficult is some organisations just haven't got, got a clue. Some are recognizing it and going, there is a, I have in my mind a culture that we would like. Um, and you see them trying to do it of, you know, that then translates, you know, they'll have their values writ large on the wall or it'll translate into an employee value proposition. What people don't do is go, let's talk about the reality of what it is right now. Um, and that's where you go wrong. You know, if you're not, if you're going through change, but you're not recognizing where you are now then how do you know you know how do you know how you're going to get there exactly how do you know what steps <laughs> wow. how do you know what steps to? Yeah. the crucial part about going anywhere is where am i now where do i need to go yeah. pretty sure a gps needs what, to know that too yeah yeah if you don't understand that about your organization as a whole but also of your people then how are you ever going to make the change necessary to be successful either either because you're going through an externally forced transformation like a pandemic mm -hmm. or because you're looking at your organization saying we need to be different to operate in the marketplace unless you've got to call out the specifics of actually the behaviors in there are pretty toxic mm -hmm. let's yeah. call it out and do something about mm -hmm. it not let's put on a webinar about wellness yeah. that's not going that's not going to solve the problem. And, and it, you, so you see so many organizations pick, the, you know, it's about taking that effects-based approach. Rather mm. than picking the random initiative that someone else is talking about, what's going on in your organization? Yeah. Yes. You need to fix it. Yeah. My, you know, inside all I'm, all I'm hearing is, you know, we, we talk about the economic social impact that we, we've also seen when it comes to diversity, when it comes to inclusion and equity, and in the States, Adam, after, you know, George Floyd happened, there was a lot of kind of internal reckoning that a lot of organizations did to say, well, here's where we stand and here's what we're all about. But to your point, did they look inside the organization to find out what's the reality? Mm -hmm. And now I think that, uh, you know, part of the great resignation, part of the war for talent is individuals can see through that, right? They can see on your website, here's your leadership team. I don't see the diversity that you're speaking of there, right? I don't see the representation. And you you kind of put this into, you know, your seven rights. You're talking about the right shape of an organization. And, you know, that shape can be your demographic makeup. And Absolutely. so how, I guess my question is, how can organizations use that lever in your model to say, we do have these diversity goals, you know, whether it be around, you know, race or gender or sexual orientation, how do we use that as part of our input? into that effect space to help us get to where we want to see you know from from a, a goal standpoint the most important bit is you've got to you've got to recognize why mm -hmm. and you've got to stick to that why yeah so i see a lot of organizations who will go who will who will do who will talk about you know let's take the diversity angle and they might say do you know what we need we want more women we want more women in the the organization why are you wanting to do that? And that's the, they don't sort of do it. If, you know, people are talking about the outside the organization, we think it's a thing. People have been protesting. Yeah. We need to do something about it. And what happens is when the rubber hits the road, 
they go, I'm going to go with the bloke. I'm going to go with the man. Mm-hmm. And that's what I see all the time. You go, right, well, we'll put these mechanisms in that will help do it to check this and check that. Yeah. We're choosing the man. Mm-hmm. Once you recognize why it is that you're trying to do it, and it's going to, and the crucial bit is it's going to be different for, it's going to be different for different organizations. Mm-hmm. So here's, here's one, you remember this from the, from the book, but this comes from, Simon Fanshawe, absolutely fantastic yeah. gentleman, who's the who's the founder of, of Stonewall, and he worked with one of the TV companies in the UK, and they recognised, oh, we want more women, we want more women on screen, but they hadn't worked out the why of why they why they would want more yeah. women on screen. Yeah. And what you used to have in the UK, and I don't know whether this was um, ever the case in, in the US, but we we have the thing called panel shows, which is a comedy vehicle disguised as a quiz sure. Um, sure. <laughs> and you know and, and people are sort of throwing things at each other and what used to happen is if it was all men lots of banter th- people throwing things at each other yeah. and then there was the point where they go actually we should have some diversity on so you had a token woman what was known in the sort of 90s as a ladette who behaved very much the same much as the men yeah. and very much just trading <laughs> trading jokes what they recognised is when you put more women, when there was greater female representation on one of these shows, it was a different type of humour. It was a humour that built. People would build on what someone else was saying rather than trade more appealing to a female audience. Mm-hmm. Why would that matter? Well, when you looked at who has spending power within households within the UK, it was women who had greater spending power of making the choices. So why do you want more women? Why do we want more women? Because these sh- if we have more women on the shows, they're going to appeal to a female demographic who have got greater spending power and will give us greater advertising revenues to tap yeah. into these women. Now there was a reason. So there wasn't a, oh, but that man's better. You yeah. were reminded by, why are we trying to do it? Mm-hmm. So once you recognise what's the why that's driving you to say, we w- want more men, we want more women, we want this mix, that mix, whatever it is, recognize it mm-hmm. and then build the plan on that basis. Mm-hmm. So then you won't be tripped up by actually the way I, as a hiring manager, I'm going to be recognized and rewarded. Mm-hmm. I'm going to mm-hmm. take a safe bet and go with what I know. Yeah. Stick with why, that's what allows you to move the dial. I, and, I saw, and I totally agree with it. And that's why I think... Um... I think a lot of people found their why during the pandemic just because they had a huge time out, right? Uh, there was less distractions. It was an opportunity for them to really be in thought and say, can I do this for the next 30 years? Um, and I think a lot of people kind of took that opportunity to, to, to Chris's point is really reflect and say, is this the best environment for me? Um, and, and some are, are starting to see how those false pretenses or those marketing, right, that we're, the business is doing externally that really... If I'm working for that organization, I know that not to be true, that then I start to be distrustworthy, right? And that's the, you're not resilient. You don't owe anything to the organization at that point. And a lot of people are start speaking with their feet. Um, one of the things that you said is, um, I think is understanding where we're going um, earlier within the process, because it makes, we can probably more effectively communicate that as well. And I think Adam is kind of where, where you were touching on is like, if we know where we're headed, we can effectively communicate that to the, the employees. And in your book, you said to really unlock engagement. Um, and this is our, my final question and then we'll kind of end, but to really unlock engagement is to give people closest to the process, to the problem, a piece of that process improvement pr- pr- program and strategy, which I love. And we've seen the effectiveness through town hall meetings, which all of a sudden became a thing during the pandemic. It's like to build that transparency. And I think I also call for that from internal in the organization is show your diversity, equity, and inclusive numbers, right? Right on the career page, if you say that you are focused on this and let's see where you are at today and let's see what improvements you make up over time. Um, so from, from that perspective, can you kind of go into, because it is going to be all hands on deck from a process, from a job description, from future job descriptions, it is going to be an all hands on deck. Can you kind of go into how organizations can understand giving a piece of that process improvement strategy and plan is really how they're going to unlock their true engagement of their workforce and continue to innovate long term? So 
I think we'd all recognise that if some it's it's about skin in the game. Those who've got skin in, skin in the game, those who believe that they own it, um, <clears throat> are going to make the greatest strides in creating the outcome. And remember, it's it's all about the outcome. It's not about the genius that sits yeah. behind it. I would rather have an 80% solution well executed than a 100% solution badly executed. <laughs> and, and you see, and again, you, and it's again where, where things like data trip us up of, oh, I need more information. Mm-hmm. They don't. They, know, they, they will make a solution that gets us into a better place. Yeah. So by taking that step back and thinking, um, you know, what is it that, what's the outcome that we need? What's the effect that we need to create? Um, what needs what needs to happen within particular time frames? And if you if you're stuck if you if you're stuck at that point, use the time frame use the time frame as the approach to say, well, if these things don't need to happen within this period of time, how much time do we genuinely have to sit here navel gazing, looking at another set of another set of numbers? What is it that gets us to the you know to a workable solution? within the time frame because that's the crucial part yeah. and when you do that that starts to give people at a leadership place more confidence to be able uh, to be able to do that mm-hmm. but crucially it needs to it needs to start from the top because one of the things that one of the things that will drive people to act in a way of i need to do this mm-hmm. it's one of two things it's either going to be from a sense of hubris I'm the only one who knows this. No one else knows it. All my people are idiots. Dreadful approach. Yeah. There's got to be business leaders like that. I hope for you. <laughs> well, that's going to be one. That's going to be one group. Yeah. The majority is they are simply going to be responding on the basis of how they are recognised, rewarded, and punished. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, if it's happening at the top. And people are saying, well, it needs to be absolutely perfect or I will judge you. People are going to stall. It won't get done quite as well. But if we trust and empower our people right from the very top, if everyone is trusting and empowering people and saying, and everyone's taking the view of 80%, 80% well, you know, 80% well executed Mm -hmm. is better than 100% badly executed. Then you start to move things into the right place. And that's where you start to utilize the experts that you hired in yeah. based on elements of their expertise and use people for the skills and value that you're paying that them for. Bring. Yeah, I love that. And, and great, just to kind of summarize on. real quick. So you uh, we had a, a guest a few weeks ago, Pam Burns, and it was amazing because she did not take a data driven approach, but seemed to know what was going on within the organization because she had more conversations with people, right? To your exact point. And I was trying to, I was really struggling to say, well, how the heck does she have such a good pulse on that business without using any data? And yeah. and I think you just articulated that. You kind of brought those two stories together and say, yes, this is important, but it cannot be the end all be all. You still really need to ask those people that are closest to the problems and really they will put the, the story together for you um, from, from, a, from a storytelling perspective as to what is really going on, right? We can sit always remember three thousand miles away and see it. Yeah. yeah, everything is data. Yeah, not just the stuff you get out of the systems, not just yeah. the thing that you get from finance. Everything is data. Mm. The absence of data is data. Mm. So once you yeah. start recognizing that data isn't just what's sat in your systems, mm. then you recognize that qualitative conversations. Mm-hmm are equally data points that help you form that help love you form that. Your yeah. love that. and you know, the amount of organizations that i've seen over engineer over engineer some form of employee listening rather than go i can look on Glassdoor and tell you yeah literally, <laughs> literally. <laughs> have you tried just speaking to some of them yeah but those are only disgruntled employees. They're just sharing their what they're unhappy about. They don't, they don't really. And I found that this is just a fascinating conversation, Adam, and kind of just to end in a summarization is, is that I think you touched on a lot of the things is that we have this obsession of perfection. Perfection is energy draining. And sometimes we've seen organizations just here locally in my back of the woods, Xerox, 
and Kodak, uh, prime examples that they needed perfection before they went to market with their strategy, right? And we see how devastating that was even before the pandemic, while the world changed a little bit slower than it is today. So to Chris's earlier point, the need for agile workforce planning is all the more important when we're moving forward in a direction where we're saying skills are only going to be good for two and a half years. That changes our functionality and our understanding of institutional education systems. That kind of starts to say, what are we doing through K-12 to to just prepare and give them the abilities to learn these skills and at a quicker rate? Um, but this has been a fascinating conversation. I just want to, again, tell all our guests that if you can, get your hands on this Agile Workforce Planning book by Adam Gibson, because it really was an un unbelievable opportunity to learn of what's coming. So we get caught, so caught up in the action in our daily lives that it's hard to see what's coming, right? And we can have that long three, five-year plan, but that needs to evolve and will continue to evolve probably on a monthly and a quarterly basis at the rate that we're changing. But Adam, I just want to say thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of the show. Pleasure. Thanks for the book that, I, that you did not buy me, but it was a fantastic <laughs> book um, because it really kind of touched on a lot of the things that we see as the future of HR Absolutely. and really as we kind of push forward the HR revolution for the evolution of business. So thank you again so much for being a part of the show. Pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks.